Hello there, I'm Azaria Tagaya, your host for Ringgit Sense Plus, powered by Ringgit Plus. This week we're talking about a topic which was heavily talked about in the news recently. 2,700 people sickened by toxic fumes. Dozens of people, mostly students, admitted to the hospital for breathing difficulties. All this from 20 to 40 tons of toxic chemicals dumped into Sungai Kim Kim at Pasir Gudang Johor. Now, this incident has been a wake up call on the need for better better protection of our environment and how vulnerable we are to man-made disasters. While no emergency was declared, many residents chose to evacuate their homes to escape the toxic fumes. And on this show, we've always advocated the need for insurance to protect yourself. Now, this incident made us ask this important question. Does home insurance have a role to play in helping residents who have to evacuate their home? So, what is home insurance and what does it protect? We turn to Emmanuel Neve, CEO of AXA Afin General Insurance, to give us a basic definition on the topic. There are different types of insurance. Uh, I would say the first one is about protecting your savings and life in, in case of death, and that, that's an important one. The second one uh, is about protecting your health which is related to all the medical uh, you, you may have to encounter if you were to be, to be sick, seriously or even uh, not so much. And the third uh, category of insurance is about protecting your physical assets and your liabilities. And uh, home insurance falls under the third category, which is about protecting people's physical assets and by extension, a bit of liabilities related to uh, the family, uh, father, mother, and, and kids that could do something wrong somewhere and break a glass in a restaurant or whatever, but it covers this physical damage and liabilities. Basically, home insurance is about compensating a customer when his or her home or the contents of that home are destroyed following certain incidents which are covered under the policy. The main perils we have, it's about uh, fire, explosion, flood, and any of other similar uh, perils, with a bit of extension from time to time, which could be cost of demolition, a few other things. But the main, uh, the main features are around the fire, explosion, electrical damage, and, and, and things like that. Basically, the main features about a home insurance policy encompasses physical damage to assets, and these include the home or building itself, the contents in the home, and also stocks that are kept in the building if the case applies. However, as with all cases, home insurance policies do come with its own set of exclusions. The main exclusion of home insurance are exclusions that are applicable to every type of customer, and not just in Malaysia, but on the whole planet. It's about war, civil war, uh, terrorism, uh, nuclear and uh, radioactive uh, things, uh, and a few others, but I would say these are the three main ones uh, we, we have in all the code policies. Just to give you the, the reason, because people are saying why, the reason is that there is an accumulation of risk. If there is a war, more likely a lot of people will will die or will suffer of, of losses. A nuclear content, it's about uh, having a, a huge uh, land contaminated where you have a huge amount of money uh, to spend to compensate the customer and the company are not in a position to cover that accumulated losses in terms of, of money because it's too big. Taking into account recent cases that we've read about in the news, case in point being the Pasir Gudang chemical spill, would home insurance have protected the residents affected there? AXA says in general the answer is unfortunately no, since most policies would list down physical damage to the home itself and would mostly not include things such as air pollution or having to evacuate due to such incidences. We also spoke to Anthony Lee, CEO of AIG Malaysia Insurance Berhad, to get his views and according to him, AIG in fact does have a unique product that does cover such incidences provided an emergency evacuation is declared. Obviously this thing doesn't occur much, right? So it usually covers flood, 
fire, lightning damage, etc. Mm -hmm. um, we actually have a product which is an all risk product for home insurance. So we would, if they declared a, an emergency evacuation, we would pay up to 50% of the sum insured for your travel, accommodation, and even your pets. Mm. So that, that's a bit unusual. So we have an unusual product that actually gives you some coverage for this at least. However, the level of awareness among Malaysians concerning the need for home insurance is currently quite low. There are roughly 25% of uh, house owner who have a home insurance policy. 25%. In European country is 100 uh, percent. It's about protecting our own physical asset. Uh, nobody with other mindset would consider I can afford to lose my house. I have to protect my house before my car. Uh, that is not so much uh, uh, in the Asian uh, mindset, which is a fact, and, and that's it. So the penetration rate of home insurance is very, very low. So typically is the more well-informed, well-educated uh, urban people that, that, that obviously buy it. Um, so there's, there's, there's a lot of uh, more that people need to do to get aware and buy. And it's cheap actually for what you uh, get covered for. It's important that you have it. And you know, we have robberies, theft, all these things all happening as well, right? So flooding is definitely much more prevalent, more flash floods, all this kind of stuff. Um, so I think hopefully people realize you know, when you've had a flood, actually the trauma to clean up after is quite significant. Mm -hmm. um, can take weeks and, uh, you know, so I think people underestimate that. <laughs> if you do decide on getting home insurance, as always, make sure to read your policy carefully on what it covers and what it does not. Ask the agent selling it to you a lot of what-if questions so that you understand it fully. Now, man-made disasters like this only reinforces our point that you also need health and life insurance. If you can afford it, do get it in order to protect yourself. To learn more about how health and life insurance works, find us on Facebook as we've done stories on this topic, which you can watch there. After the break, we take a look at environmental liability insurance. Does it have a role to play in protecting the general public from man-made pollution disasters? We have the answers after this. Welcome back. The chemical dumping at Sungai Kim Kim has left the government footing the bill for the 6.4 million ringgit cleanup cost. There's also the long term health care cost of treating the residents affected. The government is already looking into amending laws to make the culprits of this mess pay for it. However, what if the cost of cleanup is beyond the means of the culprit? And what happens then? And what if there are future environmental pollution incidents, perhaps bigger than Sungai Kim Kim? We met with the CEOs of two insurance companies in Malaysia to talk about what role environmental liability insurance can play in Malaysia. Environmental liability insurance is a form of liability insurance which protects a company from damages for accidental damage or pollution that it has caused. It is known by various names. For example, AIG Malaysia sells pollution legal liability insurance and contractors pollution liability insurance. Overall, it's designed to help pay for the cleanup and financially compensate the victims. However, these types of insurance are not very popular in Malaysia yet for many reasons. The two CEOs we met shared with us their disappointment on the lax environmental laws in Malaysia and how it doesn't make environmental liability insurance mandatory to help prevent pollution. Where environmental insurance can come is when there is a very strong uh, frame of rules, procedure and uh, risk management that will limit the risk to what is the most accidental and unexpected event. So then there is a cover. But putting some chemical in a river on purpose, it's much more difficult to insure. The, the Malaysian laws were drafted in 1974. Right? So there are some laws, but they are fairly out of date. So if you take Europe, Europe 
came up with a real change in 2012, huge new laws, and they treat the, the environment like, almost say, like a third party. So if something happens to it, whoever is, is accountable both for turning it back to its pre-state, mm -hmm. pre-pollution state, and also the time during which you can't use it, there's also a cost to that, and companies have to, to pay that. Uh, I've been in, uh, around the, the, the region. When you talk about the liability insurance, people are looking at you, what do you mean, what, what are you talking about? Uh, the point is, liability insurance is helping those who need to be helped in case they do a mistake toward a third party. But having to buy an insurance policy with a few, a few constraints will improve the quality of what they are doing and there will be probably more quality control, there will be probably more uh, looking at uh, uh, process, uh, so things could be much better, meaning that the likelihood of an event will reduce significantly. According to Anthony, AIG has 25 companies in Malaysia that have bought environmental insurance, most of which are oil and gas companies that have dealings with American companies. When I see some Malaysian company who have to interact with a European American company, the first question they are asked when they go for a tender is, what's your limit of your liability insurance? It's just the fact that by having one, there is already a certain level of comfort, and if there are none, it looks like an irresponsible position. And then you don't, don't contract with these people. Environmental insurance can also cover other industries like hospitals, hotels, and even landscaping companies. Anthony says the annual premium could be as low as 1,000 ringgit a year. A contractor is uh, putting in some landscaping and they bring some earth, they do that work, and then later they discover that in that earth was asbestos material, which they weren't aware of at the time. So that's something we would also come in there. The, the, um, policy would trigger and you know money would be paid to do that cleanup and, and the key is cleanup because cleanup you know actually takes quite a considerable amount of time he adds that more and more countries around the world are now making environmental liability insurance mandatory Korea now is mandatory for companies to buy so it's now the fourth largest market in the world for environmental insurance mm -hmm. um, China apparently had new laws in 2017 and I think they're gonna do it as well and I'm, I was told Vietnam also seriously considering making it um, compulsory. When environmental insurance is made mandatory, companies would have to deal with the safety requirements set by insurance companies to reduce risk of pollution. They would also need to have a panel of experts ready to clean up in the case of pollution-related incidents. With stronger regulations, companies can be made to explain how they will finance the cleanup of an accidental pollution. However, there is a catch as the insurance won't cover intentional pollution. Let's say the company knew about it and everyone at the top authorized it and go and do this illegal thing. Obviously, it won't, it won't be covered in that, in that circumstance. Anthony says that penalties for polluting the environment should be heavier so that companies that do pollute intentionally are made to pay. If you care about the environment and the, the long-term costs are much higher than just a cleanup, right? So I think it's, uh, we, we as Malaysians you know, need to be much more careful and uh, have some responsibility for, for our country. Um, I think this shows that the enforcement is, is unfortunately uh, too poor because I think we've never assumed that companies that people are doing this mm. but now it looks like everyone you know is is too easy to do and get away with it so that's that's what needs to change environmental liability insurance does have a bigger role to play in Malaysia in protecting the victims of accidental pollution but only if we raise our standards in preventing pollution well, as always, we try to answer questions from viewers about money. So after the break, we have our partners at Ringgit Plus help a young couple. Now, these individuals will be graduating and entering the working world very soon. So they're wondering if they should get a car. How about taking up a personal loan in order to get married? We answer these questions after this short commercial break. In the meantime, if you have a question about money that you need help with, find us on Facebook and message us there. See you after this.
Hi, back with us on Ringgit Sense Plus. Now, earlier we spoke about home insurance and environmental liability insurance, and you can watch those videos later on on our Facebook page. Now, for this part of the show, we're again turning to Facebook, where we often get questions from you, the viewers, about personal finance. Now, we've changed some of the data and some of the names in this question to help protect our viewers, but basically the answers and the situations are basically the same. So to help answer these questions, we'd like to welcome back Bruce Tum, Head of Financial Advisory Channel at Ringgit Plus. Hi, Bruce. Hi. Hi, thank you again for joining us on the show. As always, it's fun to have you guys help us with financial problems that our viewers are facing. So this week, we have a question from Roslan. Now, Roslan is 21. He's actually still studying, but he will be graduating soon. And he has a girlfriend, Fatima. Uh, of course, they're planning a future together. But for now, uh, Roslan wants to find a job in the Klang Valley when he graduates. And his parents and also his girlfriend, Fatima, have actually hinted to him that he should buy a car when he does so. So currently he uses public transportation and he's worried about the financial implications if he does decide to purchase a car. So what would be your advice to him? Now, Roslan's concern is actually very valid, right? Um, a car is essentially the next biggest investment or, or an expense uh, mm. next to a housing loan, right? So, um, so going into that needs some sort of consideration because mm. Um, it takes it, it's it's medium to long term, mm. right? It's it's probably between five to to, to nine years, yeah. right? Um, uh, according to budget 2019, um, a typical monthly expense for a MyV, a product of MyV, mm. uh, inclusive of uh, the monthly repayments, the patrol, the parking, and also the maintenance, mm. is roughly 900 ringgit. So that's a monthly repayment. Mm -hmm. So having having that. Uh, that in mind, right? A fresh grad's pay, uh, starting pay in the Klang, uh, in the Klang Valley, mm -hmm. central area, uh, according to um, according to uh, the uh, salary report 2018, yeah, is roughly 2003, 2300 ringgit. Okay. So, uh, which means that the take-home pay will likely be about 2000 ringgit. Mm. Uh, so, in, in that sense, um, the affordability portion of, of uh, being able to uh, to, to buy a car is is actually uh, leaves much for consideration. Mm. Yeah, really. Uh, but there may also be a case whereby uh, the job is actually requiring uh, a car. Yeah. Right. Such as such as um, a sales or marketing job. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, in this instance, usually what happens is the company will will also uh, uh, subsidize your uh, for the usage of your car and mm -hmm. also mileage. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, so that. Uh, if if that happens, then it might uh, come into consideration of, of actually buying the car. A general guide for purchasing a car um, is that the monthly repayment should be uh, fifteen percent or less than the salary. Mm. In this case, it looks like it's about three hundred fifty ringgit. Mm. Yep, okay. three hundred fifty ringgit. So uh, so there is there, there is a uh, limited. Uh, choices in terms of the cars uh, that he can he can look at. Mm. Uh, of course, the next thing is loan term. How long you want? The longer the longer the tenure, mm -hmm. the more interest you're paying. Yeah. Because uh, it's not exactly a, a, a very very low interest. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, and also uh, cars depreciation. Mm. Uh, so uh, looking at depreciation because uh, uh, over time they will need to maybe upgrade for an another car and then the depreciation actually takes. Uh, if if he can. Uh, he can juggle his finances as such, then yeah, maybe he, should, he can consider buying a car. I see. So with the guy that you just gave us, maybe he can use that to see if he can actually afford it. Okay, so Roslan is also um, considering another thing. He's planning to get married to his girlfriend Fatima in about a year's time after he starts his job. So he plans to start saving for his wedding with the income um, for his marriage and Fatima tells him that they should get married faster so that they can actually save money on rent and food if they stay together. So she is suggesting that Roslan takes up a personal loan to pay for their wedding. So what do you think? Is it true? Will they save money that way? And what about taking the personal loan? Do you actually advise that? Okay. Uh, okay, do bear in mind that borrowing is always fun, mm. right? Because you get a sum of money all, all of a sudden. Yeah. But the repayment is never fun. Yeah. Right. So uh, the likelihood is that when they get married, they will need to uh, 
to rent a bigger place. Mm -hmm. Not only uh, not uh, a room will not suffice. Yeah. Right. So so they need a bigger place. So rental costs will, will also escalate, and uh, in uh, food will also be a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, they they uh, they can cook, but then uh, it'll be a bit more. Everything else will probably stay uh, stay the same. Mm. Right. So uh, so looking at uh, just. Uh, for example, looking at a fifteen thousand ringgit loan for uh, as a as a as a wedding uh, personal loan financing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the repayment uh, at an eight percent interest rate over five years will be about three hundred fifty ringgit. I see. Yep. So um, so if uh, I think basically you you need to see whether this three hundred fifty ringgit would be. Uh, uh, would be you have to weigh out whether this this three hundred fifty ringgit um, versus the savings that they will get mm. uh, s staying together. Yeah. Would this be justifiable? Yeah. So, because if it is, then yeah, um, please by all means. Okay. Yeah. But otherwise, uh, if it's if it adds into the burden and things like that, then I think it's uh, uh, it will be quite burdensome because because uh, we don't know whether Fatima will be. Uh, will be working thereafter, okay, yeah. uh, or, or she's going to be a stay-home wife, mm. yeah, and, and and things like that. Okay. Well, thank you so much for helping us. Hopefully, Roslan and people like him have learned something from what you've shared with us today. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. So much. Well, that was Bruce Tam, head of financial advisory channel at Ringgit Plus. As always, we are happy to have them with us on the show. And guys, that's the end of today's show. Now, once again, we'd like to thank all of our guests for their time, and thank you to you as well for watching. Now, for more videos on personal finance, as always, go to our Facebook page and connect with us there. And if you have something that you want to know about personal finance, be it about your savings, your loans, credit cards, or maybe even insurance, please please do message us on Facebook and we'll answer your questions on the show. I'm Azara Tagaya signing off. We will see you again next time and remember to invest and save wisely.